I have a question for you today. Why do we live the way we do? As an architect, I've been considering this proposition for most of my working career. I'd like to share with you some stories of my own experiences having a family and how that influenced our thought on habitat and an alternative way of looking at how we might provide habitat for life from birth to death. We, uh, we bought a house when my daughters, two daughters, Ruby and Scarlett, were four and seven. A typical suburban house in Canberra. We uh, had three bedrooms. One bedroom was used by my wife to design and make wedding gowns. <clears throat> I used the veranda <clears throat> for uh, my own office. And the two daughters shared one room and Noel and I shared the other, side by side, separated by those paper-thin walls that they seem to put in houses. We, um, we lived the blissful life of family life with children growing up until our oldest daughter, Ruby, started to become a teenager. And that's when, that's when the friction started occurring uh, between the two. The, um, the defining moment that uh, helped us decide to do something about the shared room was when uh, Ruby was running through the house holding aloft Scarlett's diary. It was very private and precious to her. And she, Ruby raced into the bedroom, slammed the door, sat down against the door and started reading it aloud. And Scarlett raced to the door, screaming at Ruby, banging on the door, kicking on the door. Give me, give me that diary back. Give me back my diary. And uttering quite a lot of obscenities. We then, then decided that it was time uh, that Ruby had her own space. Ruby's on the right. Scarlett's on the left. I'm in the hat. <laughs> we built uh, a space for Ruby, which we've come to term as living pods, but at the time, you might call it a garden shed. It actually was a garden shed. <laughs> what we did was we built a slab, 2.9 by 2.9 metres, and then built a stud frame and raised it. So we put the garden shed on top, because that's the size of the garden shed. And then we um, infilled the rest. Now, that brought harmony back to our home. And so uh, Ruby lived there for seven years. She had sleepovers, up to five people. Uh, it's quite an efficient use of space. The uh, price was extremely low, and uh, it consisted of one light fitting, two power outlets, and we made her small furniture, including a short bed, which as she grew, we became increasingly concerned that we might have done the wrong thing because she had to sleep, hunched. But she walks erect, and she's fine, so... <laughs> We got great value out of that shed, or what we'd now term as living pod one. Now, things went well. Uh, many of you may have experienced the, the one-room conflict that we encountered. Scarlett's bed, now she took over the room inside the house, uh, had the bed head against the common dividing wall between my wife's room and I and her. And so as Scarlet started to emerge through teenagehood, we would get an increasing amount of knocking at night on the wall. I'm not, a, I'm not asleep yet. And I can hear everything you say and everything you do. So after several years of celibacy, <laughs> we decided it was time to up the ante go for Living Pod 2. It's actually referred to as Scarlet's Princess Room. And who coined that term? Ruby. Ruby had a shed for seven years. <laughs> Scarlet had a solar passive house, <laughs> double glazed, beautiful recycled timber floors, coiffed ceiling, red gum front door. So she lived there for the remainder of her time at school. And we... Um, we returned to a lovely active life in our house, my wife and I. <laughs> we, uh, we found Scarlett left and came back. 
and left and came back with her boyfriend and left and came back one more time and then left. I don't know if any of you have experienced that either yourselves or as part of your family, but uh, it's increasingly informed us about how we respond to people who come to see us when they want to design their home. That experience made us think a lot about um, what is a habitat for life? What sort of habitat do we need to take us from birth to death? Today I'm going to have a conversation with you about what are the needs that we have as people in our home environment? How do we respond sustainably to the world? And also, what would the type of responses we might make uh, to deal with the sort of situation that we experience and so many people do? I'm going to describe living pods, micro-villages, and naturescapes as a system of habitat for life. And then we'll have a look at what are the future trends that really, as you've seen from the first two speakers and the coming speakers, they're right here and right now and they're just around the corner. The first thing I want to talk about is changing needs. I have, I'm now a grandfather and have two, uh, two grandchildren. And I uh, shared with you my experiences of our daughters growing up. So we know that from a very young age, when a child is born, there's not a lot of space they need. They take up very little space. And um, we've all experienced growing up as young children, playing inside, playing outside, playing in the community, going to school. And then we've also um, seen uh, the pressure that is created in families in our habitat as people want more space for themselves. And, the, and there's a dialogue between private space and social space. So uh, as a family, we always had uh, Friday night pizzas and movies. But of course, the girls, as they move through teenagehood, could retire to their living pod and join us for um, meals and for gatherings and events. And um, we, we actually only ever had one bathroom. And that might sound uh, challenging, but actually meant that the family was forced to... Uh, to communicate and cooperate and work as a community over limited facilities. The changing needs I've also found that are becoming more and more present now is that all of the teenagers and hippies from the 60s are moving towards retirement or a later part in life and they don't necessarily want to end up in a retirement village they very often want to stay in their neighbourhood, in their community, where they've spent most of their life. And they're faced with a dilemma of the house that expanded to take in the various activities of their children and family life has either continued to grow to take in their parents or it's now to the point where half of it's empty and not being used and becoming more and more difficult to maintain. We, um, we found also that whereas when we bought a home about 25 years ago, it was about four times the cost of our yearly income. And now my daughter, who's 30, faces uh, a purchase price of approximately 10 to 12 times uh, their yearly income. It's so unaffordable to do the same thing as we did. So the, the needs of, of life in many ways haven't changed. Economics have also introduced another change, housing affordability. And um, the separation of how we've moved from villages historically to independent houses is coming back to the point where many people um, in their 60s and 70s or 80s are looking to say, well, how do I want to live, given that many of us are going to live a long, long time? Many of us here today will do 100, especially with the technology that's, that's available to us now, the diet, the knowledge of exercise and how we may sustain ourselves. So what, um, what is a living pod? A current living pod that we're working on now, I think, first of all, it's sustainable, and for many reasons it's sustainable, but one of the reasons is it's small. 
It's not huge, it's small. It could be a single apartment. It could be a communal space. Or it could be a one-bedroom one or two-bedroom home. It's not defined by the term. And there's very many different ways that we've started designing these over the last few years. But it's invariably small because we're looking to use several of them on a site. The second part is that we're designing them at 10 star plus. We're designing them as carbon neutral. We're designing them so that they don't need to be heated or cooled. And uh, that's quite a remarkable thing to say because my work 30 years ago started in solar passive design where it, it, when it gets hot at night you open the clerestory windows and bring in the cool air, but what if it's 40 degrees every night for the for the whole week. So we've moved from solar passive design to what's called passive house design, which is using every technology available to us today. It's triple glazed. It has a heat ventilation exchange system. It's wrapped in a membrane. We use, when we can, pri primarily renewable resources and materials, such as timber, plywood, and fabric and plant-based panels and boards. We can do a lot with a sustainable um, homes now, and if they're small and they're flexible, uh, we can also make them affordable for new entry young people into the market. The second part, the second most important part of a living pod, is that the sustainable lightweight structure that we don't need to heat or cool is connected to an internal garden. And that internal garden has several roles. It's in that space that we create thermal mass to store any heat from solar gain, which is a traditional approach. All the living pods face to the north, and they all, um, in the southern hemisphere, they all uh, bring in winter sun and they exclude summer sun. We have one um, living pod that was actually a two-bedroom small house that we finished two years ago, and the couple... Um, uh, received their 10-star passive house and they wanted to put a fireplace in it for romance. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> romance. The house does not get below 16.5 degrees at all. That is the lowest temperature it's ever got to in winter. And um, so now they have a metaphor for romance and uh, they don't have to chop wood anymore. The living pod is... Um, then arranged in clusters on a, on a site, whether it's a new site or an existing site. So if you have an existing site, on the left there is an existing house, on the right is two living pods. That's actually a plan of our site, our home. So we have a master plan to take us through for the next 40 odd years. So we've built one living pod. Uh, in time we're going to build a second living pod that will be more of a communal space. And then sometime after that, when we move into that, in our 70s or 80s, we'll then convert our existing home into one or two living pods for either two couples or families or elderly or peers or friends. And it's a discussion we're having with our friends at the moment. The living pod we built for Scarlett uh, actually uh, was where our second granddaughter was born. And uh, I remember we were all gathered for the weekend to, it was a long weekend, we were going to have dinner. Everyone was coming over, our daughter came from Melbourne and our, our niece came from Sydney. And at five o'clock people started arriving at the door. So Scarlett arrives with a boyfriend and then next would be Kate because Ruby's not coming at six. So I open the door and there's Ruby. What are you doing here? Oh, I'm in labour. So, <laughs> so the, party, the party started and Kate arrives soon after that and she said, oh my, oh my God, what do we, what do? We do? Ruby's in labour. And Nola said, we just sit and eat and drink wine and eat and relax and talk. And then two hours later, Kate said, oh my God, there's a baby here. What do we do now? <laughs> and that's when Nola said, well, now we open the champagne. <laughs> I think, I think it, it's actually a true story, but it happened last year. But the, the beauty of it was we had um, a family event that we were able to experience in the first house and the privacy and separation in the living pod was where the birth was conducted. And the separation of space enabled both activities to happen. This is a, a metaphor for what you can do as living pods uh, when they're on a clean site. And you have the opportunity to create internal gardens, external gardens, and connection between the pods 
and connection and observation of the garden areas. We, um, we are looking to create spaces that enable community and society and dignity for any stage of life and for any type of person through that period of time uh, so that the house becomes a habitat that supports all those phases of life. The third part to what we do in our living pods and micro villages is to create nature scapes. And a, a nature scape is primarily a turbocharged landscape. And what I mean by that is that we carve into a site at every two metre intervals trenches that are about this deep and about this wide. There's a very many different designs and they've been trialled over 25 years. The point is that in our trials, we've had areas in schools and homes. And some of the areas in schools we've done and we've not done other areas. And we've planted them all out in trees. And over the space of 12 years, in the area that was water harvested and then became a nature scape, we had three times the size of tree, the identical tree species in, as in the playing field adjacent. A nature scape raises the moisture content of the soil and dramatically improves biodiversity and enhance, enhances the ability to grow food, flowers, herbs, trees for summer shade and so on. So we have one, for example, in our own property that's been there for 10 years, where we live, and we now have an, a 70% shade cover for all of our summer, and uh, we have pockets that we have to trim back so that we can keep our vegetable gardens going. Living pods and micro-villages and nature scapes are all part of the one thing to create a very sustainable habitat to deal with our changing needs over life. In a nature scape, it presents itself to uh, the surface, to the ground, as dry creek beds, as trees, as shrubs, and it's now where Louis, my oldest grandson, starts to play safely in our backyard. I started with a question today, why do we live the way we do? And uh, two things come to mind that we've seen change in my life. And I've got, I'm halfway through my life and I've got another several chapters to go. We're able right now to create incredibly sustainable habitat. The technology's there. So I ask the question, why do we live the way we do when we could do it so much better? 